DHHS and Public Health Service continue to um, monitor uh, hospital data for surveillance. We uh, currently have a very low rate of transmission. Our cases for today, um, we've had six cases over the past two weeks. We've um, seen or experienced uh, seven to 11 cases, which indicates that there is a low rate of transmission. I will repeatedly say throughout this presentation that all those individuals who are hesitant or have been unvaccinated, the county still presents a highly robust vaccination program. We are continuously moving towards more community level, more niche and pop-up opportunities. And so those opportunities still exist and will continue to exist as we combat and respond and recover uh, to COVID-19. Uh, our test positivity is 0.45 and our case rate is 0.95. We continue to be uh, one of the lowest counties in the um, in the state of Maryland, where our data, um, our, our cases have plateaued. Again, this is a seven day average uh, percent positivity rate. This is our new case rate. And as you see, the data plateaued at 0.95. Uh, the case rates will uh, fluctuate between um, one to two cases a day, today is six cases, but as I indicated over the past two weeks, our average has been under one case per day and we continue to monitor and surveil the data, uh, hospital data specifically for any uh, variant strains that are out there. I know there's been a lot of discussion around the alpha variant, uh, uh, the B17 or the UK variant, and more recently the Delta variant, which is the B1617, to uh, Indian variant. We haven't seen any cases or any increases in our hospitalization or individuals presenting at the um, emergency room for COVID-like symptoms, flu-like symptoms, and there have been little to no indication of any cardiorespiratory duress from our adolescent populations who have uh, received their, uh, their, their vaccine. So that's very good news. And we continue to monitor not only the variants, but the, uh, the transmission of the variants in the community, but the hospitalization and hospital rates as we continue to increase our, um, our um, uh, number of cases that uh, our, our percentage of individuals who we are uh, vaccinated. So looking at the data this morning for Montgomery County, we vaccinated at least 65% of our residents. Uh, the state data indicates that 57% have received at least both doses or a single J&J. However, CDC has, a, has us at a higher rate. Uh, the benchmark in relative to other counties, we still have the highest uh, population to receive at least one dose or population uh, fully vaccinated. And of note, CDC ranks Montgomery County number one nationwide for 12 plus population vaccinated among all U.S. counties that have uh, greater than 300,000 residents. Currently, our um, our percentage of 12 plus population sits at 74.6% according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Again, this is indicative of our effort based on our community partners, our hospitals, our pharmacies, our groceries, and all of our, uh, our partners who've supported our testing and vaccination rate. Uh, again, um, Montgomery County sits at number one nationwide and number four for those individuals individuals who are 65 plus, and that rate is 90.2%. So we have made some significant strides, not only in our testing platform, but our vaccination vac uh, uh, platform. And we continue to respond to the demand um, as such with our community level testing. And I'd like to personally and professionally thank our uh, community partners specifically our public schools and independent school system for supporting our efforts. We were able to quickly shift and vaccinate that community and it's indicative of the data that I am presenting this morning. And of course, throughout the past 15 to 16 months, we have uh, I use data and science to lead the way. And so again, as we look at the demand and the demand is starting to decrease. Um, we experience about 10,000 doses a week. And now we're starting to see a reduction in that demand. We continue to look at strategically at those ways. I know uh, 
uh, Reverend Spell indicated that there would be a vaccination pod uh, at this week. Juneteenth event. There's also a vaccination pod uh, next week, uh, next uh, Sunday, uh, June 27th, I believe, at uh, Pride in the Plaza. And for those individuals who are, uh, are listening this morning or reviewing this presentation to the Board of Health, for those uh, community partners um, and uh, uh, municipalities who are interested in um, uh, hosting a vaccine pod, for their community events as we continue to recover, please visit our website. There's a link in the right corner box that says suggest a site. You can fill out that information or you can also send an email to C19 Vaccinations at Montgomery County, Maryland and our um, public health uh, emergency response team here will uh, respond and host the community pop-up. We can continue to work with our minority uh, health initiative partners who have been just so significant in reaching those communities. So by track, you see on the left side of the screen, right side may be facing you, those areas where we've seen low uh, turnout or percentage of vaccination. And so we are, again, focusing our strategy on those prioritized zip codes, census track, and uh, community input. And lastly, those vaccination of county residents private provider, 50% uh, of our vaccines have been provided by uh, Montgomery County uh, community level DHS sites. And we continue to work along in partnership with the emergency management and Homeland Security um, to um, respond to the needs of our mass vac sites. Um, those are the major points that I'd like to share this morning. There is a, um, a community um, school-based um, uh, vaccination clinic scheduled to, uh, tomorrow from 12 to 7 at Paint, at Paint Branch High School. Again, we continue to um, monitor all of the data, hospital data, uh, demand data, community level uh, demand data, and look at strategic ways that we can address uh, any hesitancy uh, that we have in the community. I'll stop now and subject to any additional questions. Thank you. Good morning. I just have a few additional updates. Um, I think we're all pleased to be having this conversation under the circumstances of how much we progress as a community. Um, I want to first off start off by thanking both the county executive and the county council and their doppelgangers, the Board of Health, for all of the support that we've gotten throughout the uh, pandemic. And um, it, it's a pleasure to serve and work in a community where the leaders do follow the, the science and the recommendations of um, their, their appointed uh, were hired uh, professionals to, to do some of these things. So um, I, I just want to start off by recognizing that we wouldn't be here if not for the efforts of our elected officials in supporting uh, trying to get to the endpoints. A um, couple things I want to talk about. So uh, we've gotten some questions about the Germantown site. Obviously, that site, re site remains open. We, we're going to convene again on Thursday to discuss what the volume has been like over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I think there are clinics scheduled at least through the 19th at this point, and then we'll reevaluate. I, I expect clinics will be still scheduled after the 19th, but for how long, we're going to make it probably a determination this Thursday and see, you know, what the what the drawdown will look like based on the volume that over the last two weeks. And that's what we've followed that process throughout, and we'll continue to do so for all the clinics. Um, uh, we got obviously we got some more uh, info. Looks like uh, both Pfizer and Moderna are expecting uh, vaccinations from five to eleven to be uh, submitted for FDA approval sometime in the early fall. Uh, I'd speculate that's probably the second half of August, early September for those submissions, and then we'll have that cohort of individuals to begin vaccinating based on that data. Um, we uh, are obviously focusing a lot more effort on our recovery uh, as response sort of uh, begins to uh, draw down a bit. Uh, and as as uh, Dr. Bridges alluded to, we'll continue to be available to do vaccinations and testing and all those things that we've been doing. But obviously, we recognize the need to ramp back up some of our recovery efforts as more things have reopened. Uh, we've seen you know lots of questions about reopening, but also the reconstitution of our county work sites. So obviously this week we had permitting services open for in-person services at the Wheaton office. Uh, we've had uh, eight additional libraries open. The rest will open the first week of July. Uh, North Potomac and White Oak Recreation Centers are beginning uh, senior programming, I believe today. Uh, and then obviously uh, uh, Margaret Schweinhart will begin programming on Saturday and uh, many others will be come on board over the next couple of weeks. 
We've had a shift in our uh, alcohol beverage service uh, store hours on Sundays. And so we're just seeing more and more progressive. Anyone who's been out there in the community can see that the community is opening up and um, there's a sense of hope that I, I, I have not felt uh, in Montgomery County uh, in some time. And I think it's, you know, it's palpable and, and we're making real progress. Uh, we know that the governor is talking today. We have no idea what he's going to say. Uh, we, I could speculate here, but uh, I, I don't, you know, it would just be guesses if we did. Um, and the last thing I did want to, actually two more things I want to note. On Friday, we did a, uh, a uh, economic town hall focusing on women in the workplace. That's one thing we've heard a lot about is obviously there's been disproportionate impacts in many areas in our in our community. But one of the economic impacts that we've seen is a lot of women have work, left the workforce as a result of the fact that they they disproportionately borne the burden of in 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 home schooling, in home child care, things of that nature. And so that's one of the issues, among many other that we're going to look at looking at in our uh, recovery framework. We are going to rework our recovery framework in light of some of the things that we've learned over the last year. And so. I would anticipate that you all will be hearing from us about some of the changes that we've made, different work groups that we've created, uh, merge some things together, some, some uh, lessons learned that are already being applied. Um, we will be doing an after action report for our response portion of this the event. We've already begun to collect all those things. Um, I, I would be the first to tell you that there are things that if we knew what we knew now, we would have likely done differently a year ago or eight months ago. And I think we have a responsibility to our residents to make sure that we record those things for posterity so that we make better decisions in the future. And so that uh, I'll knock on wood now that if if some future generation has to face an event like this, which hopefully we could, could be avoided, um, even if they do, we want to make sure that they have the benefit of the knowledge that we've acquired through through some, um, you know, some blood, sweat and tears and all the all things in between over the last uh, 15 months. And the last thing I will note is if you saw yesterday, the American Medical Association reported that 96% of practicing physicians have been vaccinated. Uh, this is my encouragement to anyone who has been thus far on the fence about getting vaccinated. Talk to your medical provider. You go to them for recommendations about your health all the time. Uh, they've deemed, with all the information that they have, that the vaccines are safe and effective. And so... Uh, obviously, we follow their advice on many other medical issues, and I would encourage you to do so in this circumstance as well. So you don't have to take my word for it, but do talk to whomever you go to for your health care because odds are they, they're, they're, they've been vac they've chosen to be vaccinated and they would encourage you to do so as well. I will stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Stoddard uh, and Dr. Bridgers. Um, thanks to all of you for all the hard work, uh, you, you and your team and our community partners uh, for bringing us all this progress. Uh, these slides continue to be uh, very, uh, uh, just great to, to look at uh, given what we've been through in the last year. And I'm always grateful anytime any of our experts can use the word doppelganger in official briefing. Um, this week, I was glad to tour uh, Novavax and uh, uh, very happy to see uh, 800 new jobs that they're planning to bring to Gaithersburg and grateful to the city of Gaithersburg for their smart land use decision on that property. Um, and glad to hear the news yesterday about the effectiveness of the Novavax um, virus against or uh, vaccine against the variants. Um, Dr. Stoddard or Dr. Bridgers, could you uh, let me know what is the percentage of each um, racial and ethnic group in terms of vaccination between the ages of 12 and, and 18? Council President Hucker, let me see if I can pull that slide up again. Thank you. And so these are the data that I have between zero to 16. Um, we have a slightly uh, lower percentage, uh, but we're moving uh, on a progressive uh, pace to vaccinate all those individuals who are 12 plus eligible. Um, and looking at the CDC data, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm specific and targeting and present you with the data that you're requesting um, for us. Um, right now, I'm seeing based on CDC, 
in comparison for the 12 plus we have we have 74.6 percent if there's if there's something else specific to that i would have to circle back and follow up with those with with those specific numbers but as the data that i have here right it doesn't it doesn't provide that level of detail or breakout it was my understanding that that was reported um through with pulse um but i'm interested can you if you could share the data after the briefing that would be great and can you comment on any equity gaps that you're seeing among asian white and black and brown children between 12 and 15 or 12 and 18. and so what we've done each time we've had a a, a vaccination uh clinic at one of the high schools or one of the area our team has provided some of the data points and uh in collaboration with um with uh, montgomery county public schools and our independent school systems and so and i'm trying to find a specific there's a specific slide that we have where um, our data team has kind of looked at some of the some of the gaps and i and i apologize but dr bridges i have a, I have a slightly dated version but i'll share it so you can show exactly sure. what i sure. think i think you i think i think i have the slide that you're you're looking okay for. uh i think it's this one right um, right that's correct that's correct if you want to talk to it go ahead dr Bridges. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing a relative reduction in in the gap. There's still some disparities and targeted gaps. Hispanic residents have reached a near convergence, but we still need to increase our vaccination strategies in our black and brown communities. We're working with our minority health initiative partners and our and our vaccination partners to reach out and provide those niche and pop-up pop opportunities there. So this data represents that the gap is starting to narrow between those communities. Now, the age gaps we're seeing similarly in those communities. One of the things that we talked about in Council President Hucker, uh, uh, we've had conversations about providing opportunities to individuals along transportation routes to create greater access. And so we're looking at those now. We also are soliciting input and feedback from our minority uh, uh, testing partners uh, and vaccination partners to uh, allow us to prioritize and, and identify those strategies. So the gap is narrowing. There still needs to be more, but this is indicative of the, of the data points that you asked. Hispanic residents have reached near convergence. And I won't read the message box, but this is pretty much how we're starting to address those equity gaps and, uh, and identify those framework. Um, the previous slide that I indicated um, from the from the data points and the geo mapping and all those areas where we've seen 35% or less of individuals being vaccinated, be it up county, mid county, lower county, east county, we're targeting our vaccination strategies in those areas so that we not only vaccinate those 12 plus 12 plus populations, but those populations where we are seeing some gaps between 18 to, to 40 year olds, individuals who are still hesitant. So we're working with our comms team to identify uh, messaging and strategies. And I believe in the conversation and, and, and the press conference that we had yesterday, where we've had a, um, we've had a, 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 a contest where students from NCPS have presented ideas for vaccine strategies that will allow us to address and assess and reduce any further gaps. I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you. And if you're able to pull out the 12 to 15 or 12 to 18 data later, I'd, I'd appreciate that. I'd be really interested in seeing that. You touched on this. Are there plans to continue vaccine clinics at schools over the summer? Currently, the plan is is, is on demand. We, we will continue to um, Help host those uh, vaccine clinics. We have second dose clinics coming up, and we have weekly conversations with MCPS. We've also are looking at and working with um, our our Rex department to see if there's any pop ups or pods that we can host at camps. But the goal right now is to continue that. We are assessing our demand rates and where we should go and target our vaccine strategies. And so as we even work with MCPS to reopen school in the fall, we're looking at those vaccine strategies that will also include the 12 plus, but as Dr. Starter indicate, those individuals who may fall in the five to 11 category with um, Pfizer, um, with the Pfizer vaccine being uh, going through their clinical trials or any other uh, pharmaceuticals or uh, vaccine companies who may come online. So we're working not only to address those issues, but one of the other questions that came up is 
the booster, if there is a booster and Dr. Uh, Stoddard and Dr. Gales and I talked about that, the strategy for that is as we continue to look at demand and scale back our operations and, uh, and provide those clinics, our community partners will be paramount. Our doctor's offices, our primary care physicians, as Dr. Stoddard indicated, will be paramount into similar to a flu vaccine to provide those boosters. And so we're looking at all these strategies and putting them in place and assessing the most effective strategy to meet the targets and the demand of the community. The one other comment I would add to that is, uh, in addition to the pop-up clinics, I do know that we've had conversations about utilizing the school-based health centers where we typically do the return to school vaccinations. Obviously, you know, COVID vaccine aside, we want to make sure that everyone has their appropriate vaccinations going into the next school year. Uh, some people, because of the the nature of the last fall, you know, may you know th- that may have been a gap that existed. I don't know the numbers on that, but obviously that'll be a major focus. And having COVID vaccine at those sites to catch people who are coming in for their other vaccination opportunities is going to be important. So the, it's sort of going to be a layered approach to try and have as many opportunities throughout the community as possible. Uh, and also, we know pediatricians are are increasingly getting vaccine available to them in their respective offices. And so obviously that is a it's sort of a make it as easy as possible to have vaccine available for young people and candidly adults as well. Thank you. Yeah, no, I I appreciate all that. Um, um, And as you know, everybody has a school cluster, not everyone has a doctor, Um, but it's great that more doctors are are having doses available. And we've talked, you and and Dr. Bridgers mentioned the importance of being on transit routes. Um, There are so many uh, schools, elementary schools, middle schools with school-based health centers, um, including the one where my kids go to Rolling Terrace, um, in those orange zip codes that you just showed us on the map that everybody in the community knows how to walk to or bike to. And we've invested in not enough, but many sidewalks to get people there safely. So I really would encourage you to use that, you know, vigorously over the summer. And I'll continue to uh, talk to you about it offline. But I really think those are important community resources that are trusted and that people know how to reach um, and are accessible to people that aren't privileged enough to have a car. Can I just ask one last question about our census teams and whether they're still doing door-to-door canvassing and what they're learning on the ground regarding hesitancy? I haven't been they, are, they are. They are. They have been still doing work. Uh, uh, they have not suspended their work. Um, and I think what we're learning is, um, and I think the data reflects this, is that uh, particularly among our, amongst our Latino community, we've seen a, a, a huge reduction in the hesitancy but the, really the focus has been in younger uh, Black and African-American population. And I know that the AAHP has been focused heavily on trying to get into more of those. And, and I think, you know, as Director Stowe referred to during the proclamation earlier, um, trying to link uh, um, to more community-based activities like the Juneteenth celebration are a great way to try and get and encourage uh, addressing addressing that, that, that really last remaining big gap that we have young uh, black and African American uh, persons. There is a little bit. I, I will say the data that you saw there was twelve to sixty-four, and as you stratify by age, I would imagine, and we'll share, we'll share this data for twelve to eighteen. There are still some gaps in the Hispanic community as well that we'll be looking to address, but those have come down much more significantly, much more rapidly than the uh, than the gaps in the Black and African American population. And so I think obviously that's going to be a that's just going to be an area of emphasis emphasis over the next several months to try and close those gaps all the way and, and candidly just get as many people vaccinated as possible. And so just to add to that, uh, Dr. Starter hit a key point that jogged my memory. Um, we've had uh, multiple conversations about our uh, homebound uh, individuals and specifically looking in communities of color. We are, we are looking towards our, um, our uh, minority testing partners, specifically at African-American health program who will collaborate and support and uh, identify individuals in communities, in in, in African-American community who have not had a chance to get out and who don't have access. And through their partnership or collaboration with one of their vendors, Ready Care, we're looking at uh, identifying any additional homebound uh, uh, individuals We've, we've looked at food and families and all those various agencies that have supported homebound vaccinations. But we are, again, looking through the equity lens to see if there's any gaps in access that we're doing. So our minority uh, uh, testing partners and, and, and vaccination partners have been very instrumental. Uh, Council President Huffer, you talked about the censors, 
um, uh, team, but 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 our uh, minority uh, health partners have been very uh, informative and providing us access points to where we um, have actual or perceived gaps. So we may we may look at data and may see that there are gaps, but as they say, where the rubber meets the road, we have a better uh, intelligence gathering, information gathering system through these networks. And so we're looking at is that, that as well to address any additional gaps that we don't see any in the data. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, Council Vice President Albernoz. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. And, um, you know, just as you said, it, it really is remarkable how far we've come, but obviously still have a little bit of ways to go. Um, I want to start my first few notes here are regarding data collection, which I know has been challenging since the beginning of the pandemic. Obviously, the state is in the best position to be able to collect general data because we don't have any way of collecting data from the, the, the pharmacies and some of the private sector um, entities that have been providing vaccinations. And obviously we don't have direct control over the data that's collected at the state mass vaccination sites. Um, and so although we can collect our own data, it doesn't really provide the complete picture. And there's always, there's also been the ongoing struggle of we wanted to simplify the registration process to make it easier and streamline people to be able to come through. Um, but one of the downsides of making the registration process as simple as we made it is it didn't give us the opportunity to dive as deeply as I think we would have liked uh, on some of this uh, data collection, which is really gonna help inform uh, future issues moving forward. So um, uh, not, not really, um, a question so much as a comment, but I, I guess I'd like to request that as we do our deep dive moving forward, Dr. Stoddard, um, that, that we be especially intentional about figuring out um, better ways moving forward to, uh, of data collection, because even now, um, although we have sort of general aggregate data uh, that describes minority populations, it does not go nearly deep enough uh, to, to put us in a position to be able to, to more uh, directly serve our community. Um, you know, Hispanic is such a wide category uh, and, and African-American and Black is such a wide category and it just, just does not do our communities justice. And that is also very much true in our Asian community as well. Um, and I think those are, that, that more granular data um, I think is going to be critical. Um, so, and if, if we can't do that in-house, um, I, I think it would be wise for us to invest in seeing if we can uh, hire a firm or somebody that can help us um, both in our analyzing what's transpired this last year uh, and then applying lessons learned moving forward and then getting to those communities, as we've said, most importantly, that we still haven't been able to fully reach in the way that we need to, as great as the numbers are uh, across the board overall. So, so I think those are, um, those are gonna be important points. Um, I did just have two questions. Um, one is, Dr. Bridgers or, or Dr. Stardard, if you could uh, talk briefly and, and explain for parents whose children are under the age of 12, have obviously not yet been vaccinated, uh, what guidance would you give those families with regards to mask use more specifically? Um, this is obviously an ongoing struggle and issue. Outdoors, I think, is fairly straightforward. Uh, studies have shown conclusively that things are safe. Um, but, but if you could provide just some guidance indoors for families, um, particularly for kids under the age of 12, I'd appreciate it. So thank you, Council Vice President uh, Albernos. I I'll let Dr. Starter speak to more of the mask um, uh, strategies, but what I'd like to talk to and offer advice to our, our, our school-age parents, um, we are starting to recover from COVID. And as we recover from COVID, our children want to be um, uh, socially interactive. They want to, to, to embrace and they want to touch and they want to play. And we're starting to also, as we look at, at, at the data, to see if there are any cold-like or flu-like symptoms. We, we haven't seen a, a lot of the rhinovirus in the community or colds. But we still need to be vigilant. We still need to wash our hands. We still need to, you know, practice social distancing 
and 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 look at those spaces, especially indoors, where we are as far as masks. Dr. Crawl mentioned that as we recover from COVID, um, uh, maybe two or three weeks ago, that that is a natural phenomena that we want to uh, personally wear our masks because that's just where we've been the past 15 months. And so what I would say to parents is um, as our children begin to interact and indoors, one of the key points that we've that we've limited any transmission or any, any, any viruses over the past month is due to hand washing those public health practices that that, that we've put in place and those measures that have made significant strides we've seen in, in the data. And so from all of the surveillance data that I see and, and, and CDC data and, and, and the American general public health is that that's one key indicator as we continue to uh, uh, recover and open back up. We still need to employ those public health practices. And so um, that's the advice that I would offer and any additional advice that Dr. Um, started, uh, but before before I just want to respond to your uh, uh, question, your comment about data uh, for individuals in the community who received uh, um, a survey or or uh, been requested to participate in our community health needs assessment. That's where we really get a lot of robust information regarding our community level data. And so through our, our Healthy Montgomery program and through our community health needs assessment, we really need individuals to participate in those focus groups and let us hear your voices and understand where those uh, uh, public health risks are or just risk in general or just, or just challenge is about, about health, community level health, that we would not uh, uh, normally hear in a, in a focus group or in a community setting or in a, a survey, but through real communication and information sharing and lessons learned. So I'll stop there and ask Dr. Starter to add any additional input about our masks um, and, and any advice to our parents. Sure. So um, obviously, I, I actually have two young ones, seven and eleven. So this is something we're dealing with in our household, and I think um, has caused the caused me at least look at look at what's out there. The American Association of Pediatrics has a really good article that I think summarizes pretty well where where this should be. And as as you uh, as you described, Council Vice President Albert, is, I think outdoors largely. I, I I don't require my children to wear face coverings while they're playing outside, even with other children. And largely, I think that's a, a reasonable stance to take. Uh, indoors, obviously, depending, you know, if it's only family members who I have confidence have been vaccinated, then they don't have to wear face coverings in those settings. But if they're playing with, um, you know, a large number of other children indoors or with, or with families who I don't know personally, and I can't vouch for whether they've been vaccinated or not, I require my, my kids to wear face coverings. Um, you know, when we're either, you know, going to a restaurant indoors, retail inside, all those things were, were they're still wearing face coverings uh, in, indoors. And I think that's generally what we'll likely practice at least uh, for a, a while longer. Hopefully, obviously, my, you know, you know, as kids become vaccinated more and as the ages for vaccination expand, you know, I know MCPS has already uh, opined on the potential need for face coverings in the fall. Um, I'm hopeful that maybe with vaccination expansion that that may not necessarily become necessary, but obviously they have to proceed with the current environment, not knowing what the fall is going to be like, because we're all speculating on when vaccines are going to become available. But, and so I think this is going to be a shifting dynamic over the next six months or so. And, um, you know, hopefully we can, you know, get to a point where, where it's not required for any population, but I think in the interim, face coverings indoors when you're around people of unknown or, or diverse vaccination status. Thank you. I'll just uh, end on a personal note. So my 13 year old got her second shot uh, almost two weeks ago. It's hard to believe I have a teenager now, but i um, really excited. And so she's 13. So she's going to be able to start babysitting this summer. Uh, she's actively telling parents who she's babysitting for, of course, that she's been fully vaccinated. Uh, and that has increased business for her. So uh, thank you all so much. Uh, appreciate your leadership. And I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Vice President. Council Member Nevado. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so first, uh, heartfelt thank you to this team, uh, Dr. Gales, Dr. Stutter, Dr. Richards. It does feel a little bit surreal <laughs> to be having these types of conversations. Um, I've often said to folks that 
you know, human beings, we are hardly ever used to having to sustain such high level of stress and anxiety. <laughs> and we've been doing that for the past 15 months, um, both on personal levels, but also this sense of an awesome responsibility to do what it's right to protect our residents. And so I think that um, being led by all of you has been extraordinary, um, as well as everyone who has worked so hard. Um, all, you know, without, as I always say, a manual, and somehow we were able to come together even through disagreement. So I appreciate that very, very much. Um, I enjoyed the conversation about the um, collection of data. It was something that I had uh, written down and uh, hope that we can address because every time we ask about the numbers, <clears throat> it is difficult if we're not able to break down also the data collection by ethnicity. Um, because it is, you know, it is hard, I think, uh, to, to think that we have an accurate snapshot if we're not including uh, ethnicity and breaking it down even further. Plus, it doesn't then help us uh, when we are getting now to this point of what you call the niche areas. Um, this is going to be so critically important. But the other question I had was just a little bit about um, sort of the strategy about the recovery um, I'll give you an example. Yesterday during our government operations and fiscal policy committee, we discussed um, some, you know, we had a briefing on the issue of access to broadband and the money that's coming from the federal government, the state um, uh, as well, and trying to figure out, you know, the best way strategies to do the outreach to make sure people know that there are going to be some, uh, some assistance in this space. <clears throat> and so, of course, really connecting uh, this type of outreach to all of the infrastructure that we have, like the hubs, like the school system, uh, activities that may be happening in the community. And so I was just curious about what is now the sort of part two conversation about recovery um, and piggybacking on all of these different activities that departments and agencies are engaged in as vehicles to disseminate the information, to do the outreach and engagement um, is there, are you guys doing that uh, proactively? You mentioned, you know, we mentioned Juneteenth. We know there's going to be the summer of peace. You know, there are a lot of activities happening right away. Um, and so I'm wondering how that is all being leveraged in order for us to reach um, those particular areas. It is very difficult to just think that people are, you know, are going to respond to surveys or are going to actively come. We got to go in there and we're already doing that through some other departmental activities and agencies. So just curious about how that is being um, adapted or um, tailored now that we're getting to this sort of point of going into the niche areas. Yeah, so it's a, uh, appreciate the question, council member. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's a, uh, it's a great question. Uh, we have obviously had a recovery framework for a, almost a year at this point, but what we're doing is actually taking what we've learned of last year and recognizing that the next six months are likely very different from what the previous 12 months have been. And so we're actually modifying that framework to shuttle some of the things that we know are important on, adding some things on and modifying some other things uh, to describe as you described. And so we're, we are meeting on a regular basis, multidisciplinary. So all that we have mission areas, as, as you well know, and each of the mission area team leads is meeting on a uh, monthly basis. Obviously, you know, we know this is gonna be a long haul type effort. I will tell you that um, the last um, six weeks or so have been very um, a challenging to balance the, you know, getting people comfortable coming back in with, you know, really kickstarting this recovery for the for the for the public. And so there are things that are, you know, farther along than others, uh, as one might be able to understand. But this is exactly the kind of thing that we're focused on is these multidisciplinary efforts. And one thing I'll, you know, as an example. You know, one of the, our realizations is the continuum in our education sector, for example, between childcare all the way through education up to Montgomery College, uh, USG and others. And what we've recognized is that there really is this, you know, we've had rec and libraries almost be treated a little bit separately from education, when in reality, they're all part of serving the same general population and we need a better vehicle to have communication and coordination between those entities so that not only we're we talking about education loss, but we're talking about loss of socialization. We've seen a lot of conflicts, you know, uh, you know, with, you know, just adults and children because people have not been socializing for the last 15 months in the way that they would have. Even if you were going to an in-school ex education experience, you likely weren't engaging in some of the same activities and, 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 
you know, playing together in the same way that you were a year ago. So everyone across the entire community is suffering from the same sorts of things. And we're talking a lot more about focusing and aggregating some of these efforts. Broadband is a great example, as you said. Um, uh, we know we've got a, we've got a, we've got a, uh, a, a work group in our uh, government operations and services mission area that is focused on broadband, but obviously having a mission area wide conversation with other partners in, in government services, and then bringing up through the missionary team leads, everyone working together in a larger umbrella. So um, I, I expect you're going to see a fair number of changes in the recovery framework. I, um, candidly, we, we brought in a handful of supporting contractors and others who have some experience in this area, and we're not going, we're not letting them go in the short term because we know there's so much of this work that still needs to be done. Uh, I know that you know we talk you know the end of the viral transmission. I've always said it was sort of a phase, but it is not the end of the event. And um, I certainly think that we are going to be doing a lot, um, not just within the agencies, but also with our nonprofit partners and other collaborative partners to address some of these. Uh, um, issues. And I, frankly, I would look forward to giving you some additional briefings in future on the recovery framework itself and other things that we are doing to get more into detail. Because I could, it's, I, I, we could be here a while if we want to talk through all the things that we're doing in the recovery framework over the next several months. Um, it's going to be challenging because obviously people are looking to get back to what things were before but we've got to keep them involved because there's just been so many impacts to our community and to our, into our, uh, our employees, our, go, you know, governments writ large, different demographic populations have been disproportionately impacted. We've got so much work to do, but obviously balancing that with this re restarting of all the things that we consider normal has, is a challenge in the short term. Thank you for that. I, I do hope that we find some time to get a robust briefing. I've often, you know, thought about how difficult it was for us to make the decision to shut things down, but then really having that realization that, oh man, like <laughs> the reopening is going to be even more complicated because things have changed. And uh, so being able to do that, no doubt, I think has become, you know, for me, I think it's, it seems like it's a lot more challenging. The last thing I'll say is that I know that the budget we did enhance, you know, the capacity of some of the communications office you know, created a translation unit and things like that. And so it would be awesome uh, if there were particular, you know, folks within those spaces that were assigned the job of scanning, you know, all of the activities that may be taking place um, through rec or, you know, celebrations and things like that. And just making sure that somebody's flagging that in order to uh, have these types of, you know, whether there are vaccination opportunities or just information gathering or engagement because it is a big task, you know, it's, it's, it, there's a lot going on, uh, but to the extent that maybe there could be somebody tasked of just scanning that and doing that and facilitating that, um, that way we take advantage of every single opportunity that is out there, particularly as we're focusing on these zip codes or, you know, these areas where we know we need to continue to send the message and continue to provide supports. Um, but, but yes, if we can find time, Mr. President, at some point, it, it would be I think it would be great to get a presentation on just where we are, the snapshot in time of where we are with the recovery uh, efforts. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I like, like that idea. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Urjwando. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. One of the great things about being on this council is uh, if you go in the middle of the end, a lot of things you wanted to ask or suggest have been done. I totally associate my uh, self with the comments of Council Members Navarro and uh, with uh, Albernaz, Vice President Albernaz, about getting that deeper level of data, but also uh, understanding, um, you know, kind of the uh, ins and outs of, of the recovery in a better way. Uh, and I know you're busy at work, Dr. Stoddard. Um, and so one of the things I did want to mention just specifically, uh, you mentioned the uh, women in the recovery. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, of, I don't know, almost a year ago now, but uh, maybe nine months, we, uh, my office hosted a, a, a big conversation about this topic, about how the pandemic was hitting uh, women uh, particularly hard. We had that month loss, job loss in December of 2020, where 147,000 uh, jobs were lost. It was all by women. Um, and uh, just as a really stark uh example of how deep this goes, it touches so many issues. Uh, I had asked OLO to work on a report around the employment issue and women leaving the workforce. They are 
uh, wrapping that up that will come out this summer. I think there's some coordination we can do uh, with your office as part of the recovery uh, to talk about that. And I think, you know, uh, to Councilmember Albernaz and to all my colleagues, uh, I think it, it will warrant a, a either a joint session or some sort of uh, follow up from the from the full council at a, at a minimum HHS and Fed um, to uh, to Councilmember Reamer as well to talk to discuss these issues in the report. So I'm just wanted to flag that and suggest that to my colleagues, the chair, the chairs of those of those co committees. Um, really excited about the news uh, every day. I I actually. I used to not want to look at Dr. Uh, Gale's emails about how many cases there were. Uh, now I'm eager. Every morning I get up, I open. It's, it's the second thing I do. I first thing I try to do is open my my Bible app. But the second thing I do is is I look at this e and, and look at how many cases there are. And it's been really a joy um, to see. And it's it's a testament to all the great work uh, that you all have done collectively. Um, I've seen a lot of people bragging about their number one in the nation. Could you just restate at what we're number one in the nation on as far as vaccinations? Because I want to make sure we all get that right, uh, because I think it's it's a testament to the work. Dr. So, uh, Councilmember Jawando, uh, uh, just to piggyback on that, the second thing that I open up is my Bible app. But the first thing is I open up is Dr. Gale's emails, and he <laughs> and he responded this morning at five twenty-seven. He's like, "Man, you're up way too early looking at the number and the data." But let me just reemphasize that among all of the U.S. counties with greater than three thousand residents, Montgomery County ranks number one nationwide for the percentage of twelve plus population vaccinated, and number four for the percentage of sixty-five plus vaccinated. And the percentage of 12 plus vaccinated is as of today? As of today is 74.6%. Almost 75. Exactly. And and for 65 plus years of age, it's 90.2%. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate that. Um, uh, as I said, a lot of my questions will be asked, but uh, just wanted to flag that point. Thank you for all the work you're doing and look forward to following up on uh, these items. Thank you, Mr. President. You bet. Thank, thank you, Councilmember Raymond. Thank you very much. Uh, it was suggested that Dr. Gales is getting some downtime, but he's emailing us right now with uh, more reports and numbers. So we appreciate that very much. Um, I don't know if you're out there, Dr. Gales, but uh, appreciate your work. Um, wanted to ask about a couple different things. Could you please, Dr. Bridger, show us the map with the zip codes uh, that had the kind of green to orange and red um, slide. What I mean. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just, you know, I'm, I'm sure we all noted the concentration along the county border, and I, I, I didn't quite see that that level of vaccination could be 30 percent, as low as 30 percent. Can you talk a bit more about what that number means, you know, help us interpret what we're seeing here? I mean, it's, it's pockets throughout the county, but it does seem concentrated as well. And of course, you know, if, if I'm understanding it correctly, that there are, there are zip, zip codes or tracks, these are tracks, these are not zip codes. There's tracks that have, you know, 30%, that's a, that's a real recipe for continued transmission in a, you know, in a localized way. So can you just talk to us about what you're seeing there in this data? Sure, thank you, Council Member Reamer for uh, your question. And so what we're looking at here is by census track, by, by immunet data, by the various data points that we see that there is a need for increased vaccination on our East County border. We've been working, Dr. Gales has been working with the health officer in uh, Prince George's County to look at those areas, those zip codes that border Prince George's and Montgomery County to increase vaccination, whether to address any hesitancy, whether or not to address any, any, any cultural challenges as we see here. 
We've been working with uh, the Maryland Department of Health and we've been working with FEMA to identify those mobile vaccination units and deploy those mobile vaccination units to these counties. So hopefully over the next couple of weeks, as we go, get deeper into this area, you will see these uh, this area change from uh, uh, light green to dark green. There was an event that was scheduled in partnership uh, in Langley Park with um, Prince George's County, but that didn't materialize. And so we had to take a step back and look at those areas. But what you're seeing here is a need. We've been working with um, our East County Regional uh, uh, Hub Director, Mr. Bantu, to look at those uh, uh, increasing more uh, vaccines and hosting more uh, pods in East County. Um, our unit is also, our, our public health and emergency response unit and our EPI unit is also looking at those particular areas. We've been communicating with our minority um, uh, health testing partners to look at those niche opportunities, those pop-up uh, opportunities in those areas. But uh, plainly put, this is an area of the county that there is a need. In all of those areas where we see 30% uh, or around 30% or less, we're targeting those strategies. One of the things that we're addressing is based on demand, where those demands are. And so we're strategically uh, looking at pods in up county, mid county, and lower county, but specifically in lower county towards East County. So that's the interpretation of the data that we have based on Immunet, based on those vaccines that we have uh, in the, data in the is, system. Yes, yeah, thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, just to really also, what is the data? Is this an estimate of the number of people who live in that? Yes, track yes, that's an estimate. That's correct. Compared to the actual number of vaccinations, and then that's how you get this you know, rate of vaccination? Is that that's, that that's correct. And what we're seeing in Immunet of those individuals who haven't been vaccinated or those individuals where we're seeing lower vaccination turnout. I would only add that um, we're using Immunet data for this, this slide, but there are 60,111 people that are not reflected in Immunet because they've been vaccinated either through a, throughout outside the state of Maryland or through other opportunities. And one might postulate those people are disproportionately going to live closer to our out-of-state borders, like near closer to Virginia, closer to D.C., et cetera. And so we don't know where those 60,111 people would fall zip code wise on this chart and how that might affect some of the colorations as well. And so that's one of our challenges is that the CDC data doesn't have the same zip code level of data as, as we collect in the state of Maryland. And so it it's, um, becomes a little, little harder to know exactly how bad is bad, I guess you could say. And, and it seems safe to well, it, it, it appears that what's the, is the dividing is the middle 50 percent there like um, is it safe to say that those orange ish uh, areas are less than 50 percent essentially uh, of yes. the total population or is it the uh, is it the eligible population? I would say the data eligible population eligible. OK. All right. Well, thank you. Um, you know, it does seem like. I mean, I know you're aware. Uh, it, it does seem like we've got to throw more effort at those neighborhoods and uh, you know specific uh, residential communities, buildings, um, and and work through partners you know, to get into there. So um, you know, I think it would. I don't know if you've already sent this or are already sending this, but perhaps you could, uh, you know. I'll direct this maybe to Dr. Stoddard as much as to Dr. Bridgers, but you know, could you send us a, a list of what the next set of activities are? You know, what clinics are, are going to be happening there and so forth over the next like three months, um, just so we can get a sense of that. And, you know, uh, so that, that kind of gets into another question I have, which is how can, I, I, I heard you say that if you, are a community organization and you have a location that you think would be a good location for, for a site that presumably the county would administer, uh, you, could, you can go to our website and you can recommend that location. Um, what if you are a community organization and you want to uh, be more, you know, you want to do more than that. You want to knock on doors. You want to get people in. You want to host a clinic. You, you can you actually have your own capabilities. Like how do, how do those uh, community leaders essentially 
come to you? Is it is it just going directly to to you, Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Stoddard, uh, or and Dr. Kroll, or or how how does that happen? Well, thank you for that question, Council Member Reamer. They can also in the on on the uh, county's website they can suggest a site, or if they're interested in either supporting or volunteering or sharing information um, with our team, inclusive, they can send an email to C. 19 vaccinations um, at Montgomery County, Maryland.gov. And with that email is, is, is active and we respond to community input and information as well as those links are still active on the website this morning. I went through and met with the team prior to um, um, sitting uh, in front of the Board of Health and, and went through those links just to make sure that they were still functional so that we can reach out and address those various areas that you identified on that map to solicit input and support from the community. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I hope that we have resources to support or to fund you know, community partners to do more and more and more of this work. I think as we are in this difficult stage of the campaign, you know, where it's far beyond making them available, it's, it's about meeting people where they are uh, you know, that we had the adequate resources to uh, make sure that we can accomplish that. Um, and I do think schools, you know, are, as, as Council Member Hucker said, you know, schools are a trusted uh, institution where people know that they can engage uh, regardless of, you know, any other status or concern that they may have. Uh, so using those locations is probably a wise wise approach um and uh and then may council member i just want i don't i don't think i meant we didn't mention this before actually it started last week so it, it skipped my mind is a uh, proyecto salute is actually doing a collaboration where they're doing vaccinations in westfield uh wheaton mall uh and so um uh, looking at the schedule now they started that last week but they'll be there tomorrow and thursday uh mary center's got uh, open vaccination appointments we're doing uh you know um uh Caseman Clinic, uh, trying to really get into the Adventist campus. On, I, on I drove Carolina. past the, uh, yeah. this morning when I was in my car, uh, as everyone saw, I drove past the clinic at the Adventist campus. Yep. And, so we're really uh, trying to really hit hit that portion of the county uh, very heavily because we know that's where our biggest gaps are. And so um, really trying to make, uh, looking at, uh, we don't have a schedule for the next three months because we typically don't schedule that far out because we're trying to be nimble and give you know one to two weeks lead time but looking at the schedule at least through the middle of next week uh there are um 12 different locations all in the down county that i can count right in front of me well thank you i mean it, it does seem to me like we we would benefit from a now kind of like a comprehensive strategy going forward where it's about partly who's coming to us and it's partly hey we've got a you know we've got a fund CASA to get on, you know, hit or impact or, you know, the vaccine hunters, like get on the doors, go talk to people. Let's get those doses administered. Um, so, uh, okay. The last, last comment I wanted to make, um, you know, I do think that the return to services is still slow. Um, you know, I, I was trying to understand in my mind, why are the liquor stores open? Uh, and the libraries are closed. Um, and I suppose it's due to the contract. Uh, you know, different contracts mean different provisions. Um, but, you know, I just think that we've got to do more there, you know, to continue having rec centers, you know, that aren't open. Uh, I've heard very emotional, positive feedback from people who've been able to get into a senior center and start to reclaim the life, you know, that they, that they have had. Um, but uh, I just, continue to be concerned we're not we're not open enough and you know our our county employees have all been vaccinated or been offered the chance to be vaccinated so i frankly don't know why uh, everyone can't be back unless the facility is used you know for another use now and it's just not open that that i understand but uh, other than that it seems to me we ought to be back so uh you know i'd like to see us moving faster there thank you Thank you, Councilmember Glass. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I, I appreciate the, the line of questioning and the comments by uh, 
council member Reamer just now, I was looking at that map as well earlier in the presentation. Uh, and unfortunately, it's very similar to a lot of the maps that we've been looking at um, throughout this pandemic. And, and again, uh, the, the same heat maps that we look at whenever we talk about some of the inequities that exist in our community. And so the efforts that we need to do to double down and uh, work with our community partners and others to make sure that those areas uh, in the north central part of the county and along the eastern part of the county uh, are more, more fully vaccinated, I think um, is really important. So I appreciate the comments that you've all shared with how we're going to under uh, undertake that work. But the, 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 uh, if, if I recall correctly on that one slide, one was the heat map uh, where the vaccination rates were based on census track and on the other side were the vaccination rates. And again, I, I think the, despite um, despite some of the, the misses and the hard work that continues, we are doing extremely well with 83% of seniors 65 and older being fully vaccinated, 72% of individuals 40 to 64 being fully vaccinated and 60% of individuals 17 to 39 being fully vaccinated. Those are really good numbers. So I just want to thank all of our residents for listening to uh, you, the health experts, listening to Dr. Fauci, President Biden, and everybody else uh, who continues to preach the science. And so that is really why we're able to be outside, unmasked, seeing each other. I love seeing on social media, friends, neighbors hugging each other. It's Pride Month. I was so Wonderful to see all of my colleagues and many of you last Tuesday as we raised the, raised the pride flag uh, and we're all unmasked. That's where we're at right now. But, uh, but just like with everything else, we need to continue doing better. There is more work to do. And so until we continue seeing the updates where certain uh, census tracts in our community turn from red to green, that will be the real victory. And so we need to keep working towards that. So thank you for those efforts. Um, and uh, Dr. Gales, uh, I hope you're having a good day off. You deserve it for sure. Um, but the other doctors are here in your steed. And um, thank you all. And we'll continue this conversation. I yield back. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much. And I'll just be brief. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for all the great work that you've continued to do in getting us to where we have. And let me just reiterate again, the paradigm shift. My daughter, who got her second shot, uh, I guess it's been two weeks now ago, uh, came to me and said, Dad, you, you won't believe it. There were so many of my friends that were there when I went there to get my second shot and get vaccinated that I ran into. That speaks volumes as to how we've shifted in terms of People are now talking about this from a pride sense in terms of, yeah, this is cool. This is great. And I think that for us, quite honestly, um, it's not going to be more of what government can do. Now, at this point, it's what people can do. Um, and so I implore, as Councilmember Juwanda always says, for the millions that are watching at home, let's talk to each other about this. We know who our friends and family are who have been resistant uh, to getting vaccinated. Uh, and they're primarily in our communities of color. When you look at that map, it's uh, Montgomery Village, it's Gaithersburg, then you look at Silver Spring, Tacoma Park. I mean, we know who's in those communities and we have friends and family in those communities. And so pick up the phone, reach out, send an email, say, hey, you know, just saw some numbers and saw that, you know, things are kind of low in terms of vaccination rates. Have you guys gotten vaccinated? It's okay to have that conversation and have her say, look, you know, it's not, and maybe you'll be able to answer a question. Maybe you'll be able to uh, stave off some fears that they may have about getting the vaccine. Uh, and you can talk about your own experiences and your family's experiences, your children's experiences, and say, it was fine. It's not a big deal. We haven't seen any complications. Everything's good. Uh, and now we have the ability to feel free and going and doing these kinds of things. My family and I went to a movie at a movie theater and sat down in a movie theater. We still have our mask on, but still, the point is, is that we actually saw a movie. I can't tell you how foreign that was from my mindset, um, but because now all of us are fully vaccinated, we felt comfortable in being able to do so. And this is the thing that I hope that folks will continue to talk about, because we know that we can get this done. We've already seen it uh, in terms of its efficacy. 
And I want to remind folks, we still have other variants that are coming out there um, that are uh, incredibly concerning. And so get vaccinated. Don't take a chance with your lives or your friends or family's lives. We all know, we don't have to reiterate about how many people we know uh, have either gotten really sick or died from COVID. We all have our own personal stories, each and every one of us. Let's not add to that. Let's not add one more. Let's make sure that we can continue to push this along. We can get this done. Uh, and we can continue to lead the nation uh, when it comes to some of these numbers, which, which Dr. Bridgers, wow, that's just amazing. 12 and over leading the nation, that's tremendous. Um, but we need to keep our foot on the gas pedal, knowing that there's still so many in our population uh, who still aren't there yet, who represent that small contingency in terms of numbers, uh, but important contingency in terms of what we know are the other aspects that are going on. Um, let me ask, uh, Dr. Stoddard, uh, there's, there's been a lot of conversation about additional uh, vaccines. And I had asked a question before about what uh, is going on regarding boosters. Has there been any talk about what that might mean uh, for folks as we enter into the fall, which we know uh, will be a much more likely area in which there's an increased uh, uh, possibility of uh, contagions uh, striking us and what that may mean for us when it comes to boosters for all of the various uh, vaccinations that folks have gotten? Yeah, so there is no additional information at this point. None of the vaccine manufacturers have made any sort of, they've spoken off the cuff about the, the potential need for boosters, but they've given no official indication about what the timing of that would be, uh, whether it's going to be indicated for certain populations and not all populations. Um, I, that, that's not entirely clear at this point. Obviously, we are sort of, you know, uh, as we downsize, we're trying to keep in place some of the contracts and other infrastructure that would allow us to scale back up as necessary with the obvious statement that we're hoping that the next round of this, whether that be the five to 11 or the um, uh, boosters that would may come later fall, winter, we don't know, um, they would be largely done through the existing apparatus that we're all more comfortable going to than a mass vaccination site. Now, obviously we will have those pop-up opportunities, I'm sure continuing through the summer into the fall for COVID vaccine and we could integrate boosters into that as necessary. But obviously, people are just more comfortable going to the settings that they have gone to for years and years for flu and other vaccines. And we're hoping that the, the, the boosters go through a similar mechanism. So we're kind of paying attention. We're trying to make sure that we don't, you know, demobilize to the point that we would be incapable of responding to uh, the need to do vaccinations while simultaneously continuing to advocate this be done through a more normal mechanism, given that it's going to be you know, even if you if there's a time frame after your after your completed your your earlier regiment that you're supposed to get your booster from, that will naturally stratify the population over when you would need a booster anyway. And so we're hopeful that that would reduce the need to have some of these um, massive to scale uh, sites in, in the fall, and we can just more do it through the traditional mechanism. And Councilmember Rice, one thing I'd just like to add that came to mind in listening to Dr. Stoddard, as we look at scaling down in, in, in our targeting strategies, there's been some discussion and some information that Pfizer disseminated and Dr. Gales has been in conversation with the Maryland Department of Health about doses. We're not we're not uh, uh, getting doses because of shelf life. You know, it came out, I had a conversation about Pfizer lasting more than a month, but Pfizer's dose can, can, can sit unopened uh, unconstituted for up to 45 days. And so as part of our strategy includes our dosing and looking at realistically what we need based on our current demand, what our community partners need based on demand and what we realistically can deploy because ultimately we don't wanna waste any doses. We want individuals to get vaccinated. We have the doses to continue to vaccinate through the summer and we will continue to monitor that output. And I just wanted to share that. Well, thank you very much to both of you. And I'll just close with this. Uh, I listen to the radio quite a bit. So um, whether it's 93.9, whether it's 95.5, 99.5, you guys are on every single one. Uh, and talking about MocoVax and talking about getting vaccinated, you guys are doing a uh, yeoman's job of trying to get the word out. Uh, and like I said, again, I think it's just going to take us uh, as a community getting over that hump and making sure that we're reaching out. And I agree with what Councilmember Bremer said. 
you know, some of the community groups that we have, whether it's CASA, whether it's Identity, whether it's NAACP, uh, all working together to try and get that word out uh, to those those last uh, group of folks who, uh, you know, ha- haven't availed themselves of the vaccine yet, we can get there. And I think it's going to take all of us. It's going to take that village to really make that happen. So looking forward to working with you guys to continue to get us over that. Hump. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member. Um, any other comments from my colleagues? Seeing none. Uh, thanks, Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Stoddard, for all your hard work. Dr. Gales, if you're listening in, or not everybody on your team, uh, we really appreciate all the progress. Look forward to your next update. Thanks so much.